So today I'm going to go through some of our research, but actually what I'm going to look at mainly is this one health concept. That's generally how we're working on this in Sterling. And the actual, the important thing about the one health or the way to manage health, in my mind, is this thing, collaborative effort, multiple disciplines. Okay, we all know that we all got to work together, and I'll come back to that in a minute again. But this is the part I like, working locally, nationally, and globally to obtain optimal health for people, animals, and environment. That's a really nice idea, no? But at the end of the day, you've actually got to go out there in the field and do it and empower people to do this kind of thing and come out of the universities or the silos, which are the universities. So from a One Health perspective, there's three main foundations here. There's a diagnostic, the population, and the immunity. So today I'm going to talk about a little bit about diagnostics and not just the easy pathogen diagnostics. I'm also going to talk about a little bit about diagnosing health and how do we actually go about that. So health biomarkers, which is a huge big universe of problems for most people, to be honest, and that's in all fields, chicken, humans, anything, that's a complex area. I'm not going to talk about population, but we all know that all individuals are not the same, and everybody in here isn't the same, so why would we ever expect that every fish or shrimp in the pond would be the same? It's not, it's, it's not correct. They're not clones, okay? So there's population variation going on in there. And then I'll come back to immunity, although we were alluding to that a minute ago, and some ideas of immunity and why fish in particular are particularly difficult to deal with. And I'll come back to that right at the end. And I'm going to show you an example which we're using in Egypt, which is based on a really, really simple observation, but it's hugely effective. Okay? So I'll come back to that later on. So this is just a framework that I, as originally was developed for, let's say, management of health in fish. Okay? So we had different levels or different areas. And really what it does is it highlights the silos that we live in and often the disconnect between the world of academic science and the industrial component and the socioeconomic component, I should say. So there's a lot going on here, okay? This is very much what goes on in the world of academic science. We've got individual fish or small groups of fish, n equals six, n equals 10, da, 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 da. And we look at different parts of their biological systems. Now in this case, I've got immunity up here but quite easily that could also be endocrinology. It could also be neuroscience. We look at small facets of that and we put them together. And then we cross over into this world and this is actually probably the aquaculture world where we have, in this case it's herd immunity, but we have very large populations. Now I think the people downstairs think they work with lots of big populations. We work with a population of 250,000 fish in a tank. On site we've got two million individuals. This is not something to be messed about with. And N equals 10 in the university often isn't quite the same as N equals 250,000 per tank. So there's an issue there, and there's an issue about measuring thresholds, health thresholds. What does that really mean? What we're really interested in is when does a disease actually happen? As we've seen before, you can go in there and diagnose, you can show the bacteria are there, the viruses are there, we know it's all there. At what point is there a turning of conditions which causes the disease to outbreak? So quorum sensing, for example, the bacteria, when do they decide to switch themselves on? Okay, then we've got environment, and I'm going to come back to that one in the end. And then we've got the classical breeding, high-low. Down here, we've got more drivers. We've got population drivers. In this case, I mean socioeconomics, so economics, modeling, disease impact on the populations. And over here, we've got the development of therapeutics or probiotics or vaccines or whatever we want to use. Okay, now all of this together allows us to create a health manager, which allows us to call something protection. But unfortunately, and what is often the case, we're all working in little parts of this in our own little silos and not really talking to the people next door. And that's the most important thing, actually, to improve and move forward with aquaculture. So as a first example, I'm just going to show you some work that we did. And this came from talking to other people. And this is just about diagnostics, OK? In the salmon industry, the first thing around. So we had a virologist who just came to our institute about four years ago. And he does point of care diagnostics. Now, point-of-care diagnostics, in his case, meant being in the west of Africa and doing Ebola testing in the field, in the tents. Okay, so portable PCR, taking people in there, diagnosed, point-of-care, now what are we going to do? We thought, oh, fantastic. Let's go from the west coast of Africa to another not particularly nice environment, but for different reasons, the west coast of Scotland. Quite an extreme place to go and work in as well. And we said, well, if we're going to work for Ebola, let's see if we can make that work for salmon. Kind of similar thing, but the whole idea is to be able to do it on site. 
not centralized in laboratories, but empower people on site to be able to do that quickly. So that's actually some of the machinery, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So we had a project where we did two different things here. And here we are up here with the point in need diagnostics. We looked at viral disease diagnostics, which I'm not going to talk about. And we looked at smultification biomarkers. Now, for those of you who do not want to know what smultification is in salmon, we all know that salmon are anadromous species. They go from freshwater to saltwater. Now, the freshwater saltwater transfer from an industrial point of view is a very important component of that process. And if you get that wrong, that leads to significant disease issues and production problems further down in the process. Now, the smaltification management of smaltification, so these are huge populations of animals that we're trying to put through a four to six week window to get an effective transfer to say these fish are ready to go to sea. Now, there was tools out there, and we developed some new molecular tools, and that's what I'm just going to show you in the next couple of slides, what happened with that. Now, the machinery, it's, it's, I mean, at the end of the day, molecular biology is cooking. That's what I'm telling most people. It's really not that difficult. So we used three different platforms to get this to work. We used an in-house, just your normal PCR, so that's a 96-well Agilent MX. We then backed this up with this one here, the smart cycler system, and that's the thing you're seeing there, okay? Now, it's about this size, and it's really heavy. Okay, so it's a nightmare. If you want to take that into the field, it's awful. But to be just to get you an idea, that is the bioterrorism piece of kit that all military are using. Okay, now it's a hugely versatile piece of machinery, and what's very good for it, you can optimize. Okay, so you can take that out. It's good for development. And then when we're actually in the field, we use this one, the GeneSeq Q16, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Okay, so that's just the development process for the biomarker. Now we knew that our biomarker. In salmon, it's sodium potassium ATPase, and it's one gene which is actually giving you the process, which is the alpha-1 alpha subunit, okay? This here, this is the old school way of doing it in the salmon industry. This is what they were doing, and what they're interested in doing is going from start and finish. Simple. Endpoints, okay? Now, if you look at that, if somebody can show me an end point in there, I'll give you a bottle of champagne right now. Super complicated. Now there's like a constellation of stuff going on in there. So that really wasn't working too well. Now that's not due to the poorness of it. It's those enzyme kinetic assays are not particularly the right technology in this case, okay? So we change this over to qPCR technology. It's really quite simple. And lo and behold, we get this nice difference, okay? And what's really actually important about this is it's robust and statistically sound. Now that's really what you want because at the end of the day, the farmers, they want us to say, green light, go. They don't care if it's five-fold up, ten-fold up, anywhere. They don't care. They want a green light. Can you do the green light? So we showed that was the case. And here's some data from last year. This is different sites across Scotland, okay? 16 different sites, I do believe. That's the start, and that's the finish on each site. So as you can see, we got a nice separation, and we can give green lights to people, okay? Now, believe me, this is not infallible. This site here went the other way. Okay, not because of the window. The reason they went the other way is their smaltification window was extended by bad weather up to 10 weeks, and you actually lose this situation. Okay, so it wasn't to do with the marker, it was to do with the management and the environment in this case. Now, that's all fantastic with our fancy machinery, so what did we do with that? And you're all thinking about this by now, I think. Okay, that's the size of the PCR machine, it's the same size as a beer. Okay, there it goes, that's really large. That's actually the portable unit that we use, and that's what we take out into the field, okay? I'm not gonna sell anything, but there's lots of different PCRs of this size on the market, but that's our general technology we're using. And this is a kind of lab in a box, so you turn up your suitcase, yeah, get your chopping board out, and off you go, no? It takes about two hours to go from fish to response, and that'll run 16 samples every time you switch it on, okay? You can run them in parallels, you can change them out, do what you want, okay? And then we're connecting that to an app, which then comes onto your iPhone, so the manager of the site can go, okay, it's time to go, okay? So it's really quite a simple technology. Now, it's so simple, in fact, that I actually tested this on my 14-year-old son, and I gave him it, and I gave the instructions, and he was capable of doing a PCR, and it worked. So really, you don't need a PhD to do it, okay? In fact, you don't need any training to do it. You just have to follow the instructions. So that's the basis of what I'm talking about, empowering people. And I'm going to show you an example of that later on again. 
What made it even more interesting is actually up here, that's the original data, okay, run in parallel in the lab. Now that's samples we have to take and ship, and it takes four to five days in RNA later. These are samples which we actually run on site, and the resolution's even better if you're doing it right there and then, which is actually makes sense if you want to get into mRNA biology stuff, but the reason is these samples definitely work better. RNA later sometimes is okay, but actually sometimes it's really quite poor. Okay, so that's kind of the basis of what we were doing in terms of that system. Now, at the same time, and let me change over here, we were also working on viral disease, so it's quite interesting to do viral diagnosis, and in this case, we've multiplexed it into three, and we can bring it down to 10, 10 copies in your sample. That's not too difficult. Like I said, that once again, that's a cooking. When you've got a sequence, you can put a target and a primer on it and optimize, it's not so hard. What's actually hard is what Dr. Briggs was saying before, and it's this issue here. What is a diagnostic window, and where is the threshold? When do you call it, okay? If you take some water on the west coast of Scotland and put it in your PCR machine, you can get IPNV if always. It's ubiquitous. So at what point does it actually become dangerous for the organism? At what point do we get this disease scenario? Now, there is actually no solution to this, and this is then, let me go back to the fish thing. Around about 30,000 species of these things out there. So lots and lots and lots of fish. If we compare that to mammals, mammals are laughable from an evolutionary point of view. Fish have found the solutions to pretty much every environment, okay? If we look at our knowledge on this, our knowledge is based upon essentially the salmonids, tilapia, sibasi, brim, sol, et cetera, et cetera, really is very limited. When we're looking, there's more than 200 species out there being cultivated. Our actual vision of that is really, really limited. And from an evolutionary viewpoint, some of these are separated by 75 million years. It's the same as they're separated by a mouse to them. Okay, so taking them all as a fish, a clone, is definitely not the right way to go. However, evolutionary biology clearly predicts that some things have to be the same and are the same across vertebrates and invertebrates as well, especially in the immune system. If you can't get to that point and respond, you will die. Irrespective of your system, you have to be able to respond to bacteria or viruses, okay? And we'll take that home in a minute. So, and I, that, I'm not actually going to talk about this too much. We use in different ways of developing biomarkers, but what I want you to take home from this, and apart from the nice colors and it looks really complicated, is that we're not doing it for one species, okay? We're doing our approach is to use multiple species and look for conserved canonical clusters of response across the board which then allows you to make predictive calls on biomarkers. If you just look for one species, often this is wrong, okay? And in fish, we're very prone to talk about species-specific differences, which is true, but underlying the structure there, many of things are similar, okay? So we use different approaches for this. So in fact, we use hybrid RNA-seq, so that's packed bio plus alumina. Now the reason I'm gonna say packed bio there is we use long reads because we're quite interested in isoforms, which are becoming more and more and more interesting. We couldn't see them before, but now we can with sequencing technology, which is quite good. And we also use maldi toff approaches and biomarker approaches. And the whole reason we're going down this road is there's now handheld MSMS devices. And if you know the peak you want, you can get it and do it on site. So once again, we're going down the same road as can you empower people actually on the site. Now, let me get to the next part. What am I doing for time? Oof. So as an example, of what we're trying to do with this and to bring it all in to the last part of the concept where is if your bio biological model is wrong, you're never going to get what you're looking for. Okay, and okay, we're guilty for this one too. So this is a project we have right now in Egypt, funded by the British Council, it's called Behavioral Prophylaxis, Informing Improved Culture System Design, blah, 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 blah. For those of you who don't know what's going on in Egypt, they're producing around about a million tons of tilapia, so it's number two after China. Huge production going on there. Around about 120,000 hectares, and the average farm size is about seven. So it's very semi-intensive. Lots and lots of small producers. It hasn't been consolidated by large industry yet, so there's a lot of variation across there. There's a lot of different forms and styles of production. But what this also leads to is there's quite a lot of chaos in terms of epidemiology, in terms of disease management, in terms of actually having access to technology and using it. Now, what's important potentially there is that's feeding 45% of the population. 
as they're moving towards intensification, they've been increasingly having what they're calling summer mortalities, which is secondary bacterial infection, probably quite similar to Vibrio's, Eremonis, nobody's quite sure, but it's definitely happening. And it's around about 20 to 30% of the population. Okay, and this is increasing. So in order to deal with the two, we're doing two things here. What we're doing is we're training and transferring the little PCR technology out into the universities, not all to, out into the producers. This is quite cheap technology. You can get this for $2,000 out in the farm, you're already using it. So it's quite good technology. So we're doing this, but what we have been doing, which is really different, is we're now applying this concept of behavioral prophylaxis. Now in the last few minutes, I'm gonna blow my trumpet about this one. Here's the simple observation about the environment. Really easy one. The vast majority of animal species are ectothermic. Yeah, we know that, don't we? You know, it's only the mammals and the birds that are not. Everybody else is dependent on temperature, everybody. Okay? Now, in order to change your body temperature, you need to move in your environment. If you want to heat yourself up or cool yourself down. Good example, sharks like to come up and eat in warm water. Once they've eaten in warm water, where do they go? Way down deep. Lots of fish species are doing this, lots of aquatic species. Now, what are they doing when they're doing that? They're managing their physiological responses, yeah? So they're using temperature to dynamically regulate what's happening their allostasis or their homeostasis, okay? So today I'm gonna to talk about one experiment, or one concept of that, which is called fever. Fever didn't just arrive in us, although we've all had it and it's particularly not nice. Fever, the ectotherms also have this. Behavioral fever and emotional fever, I could go on for a long time. There's nothing new about this. What it means is the animal, when infected, will choose higher temperatures, okay? Now this was published in the 70s. Then it was buried, never came back. So we took that and had to go at it. I'll go quickly through this. We built some tanks. We've got different forms of tanks. There's one there. There's some tilapia in there. Now this tank goes from 35 degrees down to 21 degrees and the animals can access all of the chambers, okay? So they have access to a thermal gradient. They can choose. Okay, now that's the important thing. They can choose in the same way that they probably would do in an aquaculture environment semi-intensively, okay? That's what's important. Now, there's a zebrafish, but we've done this in tilapia, we've done this with bacterial infection and viral infection, et cetera, et cetera. Now the important part here, okay, is this particular figure here. Now, current practice, and this comes back to your clear water thing as well, I do believe, it's quite similar. Current practice suggests in labs, we hold fish at A temperature, we give them a pathogen, and then we look at LD50s, and then we see our vaccine works. Yeah, that's generally what we do with most things, actually. Okay, however, Viral infection, we get a 50% kill if the fish are held at 28 degrees. Let's say they can't decide, they can't choose. I'm at 28 degrees and that's what I'm going to be. If you give them a choice, look at that, 100% survival. No viral infection, no issue, okay? Now I'm not going to bore you with this, but this is focalization of the transcriptome in different tissues and there's an emergent property of the system. Now, what they're doing is they're thermocoupling their responses at molecular levels to increase their intensity to combat the pathogen which is in there, okay? Now, that's an interesting thing from biomarkers. Going to biomarkers, this is the same thing but done in larva, okay? They do the same thing. There's the fever over there, 32 degrees. That's them loving it, hot water. This, on a molecular level, is the response you're looking at. If you did it without a thermal choice, that's your response. And how many papers are published with two-fold increase, three-fold increase, four-fold increase? This is the immune system. The immune system is like a bomb. When it goes off, boom. It's not messing about. It's there to kill things. That's what it's trying to do. So if we look at it in this case, this is with a choice, all of a sudden we have orders of magnitude higher of mRNAs, which are going to be the biomarkers that you're looking for. Hence. In Egypt, we're working on this concept and actually measuring it in the field because the animals have the choice. Now, the int coming back to end there, the behavioral prophylaxis, and I think this is hilarious, is us building rafts, digging holes in the ponds, okay, to change the environments within the ponds, and if any of you are farmers, everybody knows this already, by creating different thermal environments. And what happens? The fish choose different environments, and all of a sudden, we've actually got less disease in those ponds. 
because we're, we're just giving them a choice to do things in. So 10 years of research, cloning and sequencing and going crazy, ends up being building rafts, putting them in ponds, and allowing fish to go underneath them, which is fantastic, no? which is increasing the survival of these animals. Now, I'm being a bit flippant about that potentially, but what's quite important here is the development of the biomarker and the empowering of the people using it is happening in the field. But it is powered by the science from the lab. Okay, so that does make the connection between those two things. So from that point of view, I'm going to finish because I'm about to run it. I'm one minute over already. So I was told that's just us doing the same thing in tilapia. So every fish species we've had a go at does it. And for people who like shrimp, we know that shrimp also select different thermal environments under those conditions. So we've been playing with that. I don't do this on my own. So this is part of our team that's going on in Sterling. So that's me and the immunity evolution. Amaya Balad, she's the proteomics person. Sonia Ray, she's the one who does the behavior. And here's a typical day in Scotland at our institute. <laughs> Is that right, Matt? <laughs> it's a typical day in Scotland. Thank you. 